the Americans had two war plans for the Pacific in the 1930s, mm. one to fight the Japanese and one to fight Britain. Slim was able to rebuild an army, an army that actually comprised about 1.3 million men, most of whom, 87%, were Indian, to defeat the Japanese in battle, not just once, but twice. I agree with Rob. I think he was unquestionably the best British general of the Second World War, streets ahead of Montgomery. I think two of my death threats are for criticising Montgomery, interestingly. So he was very nearly killed in Eritrea at Galabat, attacked by Italian aircraft in 1940. You know, that was his third serious wound of his military career. It was one thing that goes hand in hand with being a soldier, the chance of being badly hurt. And, you know, without him, the, the war would have been very different in the Far East, I'm afraid. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. This week's pod has two guests, Robert Lyman and Gordon Corrigan, and they're both on to talk about the greatest British commander. Bill Slim is the nominee and we talk about his early life, his literary career, since he's just had four books published, and we talk about the war in the Far East and then line him up against his allied peers in World War II, and then against the finalists, Henry V, Cromwell, the Duke of Marlborough and the Duke of Wellington. Now, depending on how successful this episode is, I might do another featuring each of those names. So if you're interested, do let me know. Links, as ever, are in the show notes. Coming up, I have next week Roger Morehouse joining me to talk about the Holocaust. Then it's Elizabeth I. I've got Ancient Rome with Tom Holland. And I have a bonus on the coalition government of 2010 to 2015 with Vince Cable. Until then, I'll hand you over to me talking Bill Slim with Robert Lyman and Gordon Corrigan. Welcome to the podcast, Rob Lyman and Gordon Corrigan. Gordon, thank you so much for for joining me again. And and Rob, I think it's been a while, but uh, you were you were one of my earliest guests, so it's great to have you back on. And today we are here to discuss Bill Slim, Field Marshal Bill Slim who we're really going to be talking about Bill Slim for two reasons. One, his literary output, because despite him being dead for a number of years, he's just published four books. And then we are also going to get on to Bill Slim, the general, the commander. And so for our dear listeners, really, I'm going to allow Rob, it's probably best if you introduce who Bill Slim was. I mean, I could do it, but I probably wouldn't do him justice one thing I will say is that Bill Slim is one of the three generals who's out, who's on Whitehall, a statue of him on Whitehall, which gives an indication of just how significant he was in the Second World War. But but Rob, as you edited three of these books, could you just give us a brief description of who Bill Slim was? Yeah, Bill Slim was one of Britain's greatest ever generals. He was probably the greatest British general of the Second World War, and we can have a little conversation about that at the end, but if not the greatest, then he was certainly up there with with Monty. And uh, a man who made a a decisive uh, and seismic impact on Britain's fortunes in the Second World War. Uh, He was born in Bristol in a lower middle class uh, family, in the 1890s, the family moved up to Birmingham. He always wanted to join the army. The First World War gave him that opportunity. He inveigled himself into the Birmingham University Officers Training Corps before the war. Uh, he wasn't entitled to do so, but somehow he found himself in there, which meant that he was able to receive call-up papers immediately as a, an officer cadet, effectively. At the start of the war, he joined the Warwickshires. He served through a terrible campaign in Gallipoli, where he was very badly wounded, very lucky to survive. He then ended up being repaired in Mesopotamia in 1917, where he was very badly wounded again, and and again, lucky to survive. Um, War ended. He was actually having quite a blast. He wanted to stay in the army, quite like the soldiering lark, and he uh, uh, found himself in India. He wanted to join the Indian Army and the Gurkhas in particular in um, Gallipoli. He had found himself alongside the uh, men of the Sixth uh, Gurkha Rifles. And um, so he was he, a Gurkha. He joined the Gurkhas then. He joined the Gurkhas in 1919. Uh, and I think it's right, although he, he started his life in the Warwickshire Regiment, he spent most of his military career as a Gurkha. His mentality was 
uh, as uh, an Indian Army officer, a Gurkha officer, and uh, it's, it's right to see him as a Gurkha. Let's just rush forward. Um, he found himself busily engaged in 1939 to 1940 in various operations in Eritrea and then in, in Iraq and Iran and Syria. Uh, and then was parachuted into Burma uh, in March 1942. And it's Burma, about Burma, which he is best known. And uh, Burma, of course, in 1942 was a pretty miserable place for the British and uh, saw a dramatic defeat of uh, British arms. But Burma also, by 1945, saw a dramatic resurrection, a phoenix from the ashes of, of British and Indian arms, and Slim was at the head. So he was a man who went from profound defeat in 42 to quite extraordinary victory in 1945. And it's a mesmerizing story, this, this, this tale of um, redemption, resurrection and redemption. And uh, he then became um, chief of the Imperial General Staff in Britain after Monty and uh, at a, quite a significant period in British history, a time of national service in the war in Korea, then went off for eight wonderful years in Australia as the Governor General. A remarkable man. Um, and these books that uh, have been republished, actually, they've never been published before. Uh, the three books which I edited were uh, writings that I took out of newspapers and magazines that he published uh, as an individual uh, uh, writer, uh, not as a soldier, and they weren't formally uh, commissioned by the army, the Indian Army, the British Army, between 1931 and 1940. Uh, he wrote 44 articles, uh, all in pursuit of paying the school fees for his children, um, John and Una. Uh, every soldier that I know will, uh, will uh, understand those terrible words, school fees, but the and army helps it, pay for the school fees, doesn't it? They only pay for a proportion of them. only for a proportion, <laughs> and and it's everything else that goes with the school fees. So, for instance, uh, if if the Indian army officer decided to educate their children in Britain rather than in India, and the opportunity did exist in India, uh, they would have to the, the government wouldn't pay for travel, for instance, uh, and they would only pay for uh, uh, the the um, the education rather than accommodation. So there were always extensive costs associated with sending your children home. Uh, and it was a great challenge. Anyway, Slim decided that because he was pretty good at wielding a pen, he uh, made some money, a little bit of money, not a huge amount, but you know enough to help out with the bills when they arrived. Uh, of course, when the when the war turned up, the writing stopped. Well, certainly that sort of writing stopped. Uh, just but, one thing, Rob, they're written under, as a pseudonym. Is that because the army wouldn't have been too keen on him writing? The army would have been, and he admitted this, the army would have been very unhappy for Slim, for, for, to, to, have, to have known that Slim as a soldier was, uh, was writing anything. Soldiers were not, it was not, they were frowned upon if they wrote publicly. They needed express permission from the powers that be, if they wrote anything, and often that permission was denied. In fact, this was a, a real problem through the 1920s and 30s. Officers who insisted on writing, uh, either in service or out of service, it was frowned upon. You know, officers who wanted to write and had something to say felt that they had to leave the army in order to do so. Uh, there were exceptions. JFC Fuller wrote like Billy O when he was still a serving officer, and a few others did so, but it it caused enormous ructions in the army. And JFC Fuller, in fact, was uh, was regarded very badly for, for doing so in most quarters. It was not the done thing. So Slim's writing, well, there were three sorts of um, things he wrote about. A, a group of stories about the army in India and its experiences based largely around his, his beloved Gurkhas. A whole series of stories about India itself. And then actually there's a bunch of stories uh, which were frankly who done it? You know, editors of newspapers or magazines would ask him to write something, and he'd um, draft something very quickly. And and you know, they're interesting. They're they're of their time. Most of them are pretty good, actually. He was a pretty good hack. And um, I think the really interesting thing about these three volumes—they're quite slim volumes. I think they'll eventually be pulled together in an omnibus, which would be fabulous. Is that it gives a sense of who Slim is. It gives a sense of uh, Slim as a writer, which of course he's most famous as a writer for his extraordinary uh, autobiography, if I can call it that, Defeat into Victory, which is the account of the the war in Burma, which I still regard to be the best general's book of the Second World War. It's beautifully written. It's sensitively written. It's not written about slim really it's written about his extraordinary army the army that he created and built and sustained um 
throughout those those long war years, and it's remarkable. I need also to say that I've also edited through and written an introduction to the fourth book, which is the first republication of Slim's Courage and Other Broadcasts, which was first published in 1957, and it's the fourth uh, volume about Slim, published recently by Sharp Book. So we've got a bit of a cornucopia of, of Slim books, and it's absolutely amazing, actually, that... Um, these these articles in particular from 1931 to 40 have been republished when i was writing my account of slim as a as a commander way back at the end of the 90s and the early 2000s i searched diligently for these articles and, and never found them and i wanted to see what he was like as a writer before the war and eventually found them tracked them down scanned them rewrote most of them and um, it's been a really exciting journey, actually, to have them. And it's great to have them. Great stuff. Gordon, I wanted to ask you, because we've mentioned that Slim spent much of his career in the Gurkhas. Mm-hmm. And so you yourself as a, as a, are a Gurkha officer, I can see in a particularly vicious looking. Is it? K- k- have I got that? Go, What's go the free. name? That's go the free. one. Is it true if they unsheath the knife, they have to use it? No, this is all nonsense. Uh, but I, I, I get this all the time from people. I mean, the cookery, there's nothing religious or, or mystical about the cookery. It is a working tool. I mean, the thing behind me is a presentation one. I've got dozens of them all over the place. But um, the actual working cookery, every little boy in Nepal carries a cookery. You open tins with it. You dig holes with it. You cut firewood with it. You you dispatch goats and chickens and other forms of eating with it. If you had to use it, and again, people say, is it true they've got to cut their own finger? And I, well, if that was true, they they wouldn't have to be fingers. So it's utter nonsense. But it's one of these tales, just like the other story, which people seem to believe uh, about the Gurkha in Italy, who who has a crack at a German with his cookery, and the German says, ho, ho, you missed. And he says, no, shake your head. Now, all that is nonsense. I don't believe, I think it's absolutely <laughs> true, Gordon. That's, that's, <laughs> I, I was told that story when I was in prep school, and I loved it, and I believe it ever since. So don't, but what, don't what is it true? from me. What, what is true, because a couple of old boys who'd, who'd been in Italy told me that in the British Army, bootlaces are laced straight across, as you know. And apparently the Italians and the um, Germans laced theirs like this. Well, of course, the Italians were out of a Cross, it Crosses for listeners who crosses. are... Uh, sorry, yes, crosses. <laughs> uh, crosswise. And what they would do, apparently, was to go out at night on patrol and they'd because the, the lines in, in Italy weren't always very clearly delineated. It wasn't, you weren't quite sure, you know, where your own people were and where the enemy were. And what apparently they would do, according to these old boys who told me about it, was they'd, they'd creep up to a, what they assumed, a sanger, which they thought was probably an enemy sanger, and they would feel the boats of, of the sleepers. And if they were uh, horizontal, if you like, laced, then the, obviously the British had left them alone. And if they weren't, what they would do is they'd, they'd, if there were four soldiers in a sanger, they'd chop three and leave the other one. So when the other one woke up in the morning, all his chumps are dead. And apparently, and I was, just, I thought, this is an interesting story. So I asked an officer of a British regiment who'd been in Italy, and I said, look, is this true? He said, absolutely. He said, what we did find was that soldiers who regarded themselves as individuals and started lacing their boots up crosswise very quickly started lacing this <laughs> up in a conventional manner so that one's true but the business about about cookeries isn't i'm afraid oh that's a shame but uh i think i'd heard that that shoelace story as well actually so yes definitely that's quite true. a well known story i mean uh, he um, he initially uh, slim of course initially as a, as a young officer in the, in the yeah world. i was wondering his reputation in as a gurkha yes this is this well is he he was in gallipoli which was first six gurkhas which were in gallipoli they they took sari bear and i without sort of devoting the next three weeks to the gallipoli campaign which i could if you wanted me to having been there many times uh if you could capture Surrey Bear, you've cracked it because that particular feature dominates the whole peninsula. And if you can get onto that and hold it, you've won. And the British, they tried and tried and tried uh, and couldn't. And eventually, first six got up there. Um, all the British officers either got killed or wounded on the way up. Uh, so the, the battalion by then is commanded by the by the Subdar Major, the senior Gurkha. And um, while they were trying to get up there, there were some of the Warwicks down at the bottom of the hill, and this included young Slim. And um, he, the Gurkhas in those days didn't speak English, of course, but there was 
a certain amount of communication between them. And he rather liked them. He thought they were rather good chaps. So when he was eventually evacuated to India, eventually after his the wounds that, that Rob has described, um, and he wanted to stay in the army, the British army in peacetime for an officer with no money in a decent regiment was difficult. It wasn't impossible. I mean, Robertson had done it uh, before the before the First World War, but it wasn't it wasn't easy. Whereas in the Indian Army, with the various allowances and a lower cost of living, you could live reasonably well on your on your pay. Um, school fees, as Rob said, was a different matter that affected us at all. But um, so he 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 wanted. He said, "Could he transfer to the Indian Army?" The answer was yes. Could he transfer to the Sixth Gurkhas because they were the ones he knew? The answer was yes. And he arrived in first sixth, eventually in the end of 1919, beginning of 1920, and straight away was given a company. Uh, so he became company commander very quickly. And that was a company, I think, first sixth. And I remember one of his letters I saw written, I can't remember who he wrote it to, but he said he was having a, he'd just taken over. And he said, you know, they're wonderful chaps and I'm getting on terribly well with them. I'm having a bit of a difficulty with the language. Now, because those in those days, if you joined the Indian Army, you first of all had to learn Urdu because that was a lingua franca. Um, you know, everybody had to speak Urdu. Uh, then you, and when you passed the Urdu exams, you then had to learn the language of whatever you were going to. So if you're going to a Sikh battalion, you learned Guru Mukhya. If you're going to a Maratha battalion, you learned Marathi. If you're going to a Gokha battalion, you learned what used to be called Gokhali. And then when I joined, it was called Gokhali. And then after a few years, the Nepal government said, not all Nepalese are Gokas. Would you mind calling it Nepali? So it's now called Nepali, but it's the same language. Uh, but that, that's not easy to learn. I mean, it's a new alphabet. It's this is not an easy uh, task, is it? No, uh, it's not. But 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 it's written in Sanskrit or formal Sanskrit, and the Sanskrit spoken language is dead, long dead. Uh, but the, the script still survives, and Hindi, Nepali are written in in Sanskrit, and it's absolutely phonetic. So once you've learned the, la the letters, if you look up a word in English, in an English dictionary, you know how it's spelt, but you don't know how it's pronounced. That's right. If you look up something in Nepali, you know not only how it's spelt, but exactly how it's pronounced, because Sanskrit is absolutely phonetic. So in that sense, um, it's, it's not that difficult. And of course, if you're thrown into it, I mean... Gurkhas now do speak English. They didn't when I joined. Most of my service, in fact, it was regarded as rather dubious of a Gurkha spoke English. Uh, so one would, if one was married, this is in my, my time, you'd say cheerio to your wife in English as you left your quarter. And you wouldn't speak English again until you got home at night. So if you're immersed in it, and, and young Slim was immersed in it, I don't think he ever actually went on the language course. Um, well, at the, those calls, at those times, they had to pass the language exams in the battalion, and they had a munchi. So every battalion had. A oh yeah, yeah. That, that's where he would have learned it. Actually, that's right. He learned it that, that way. Yeah. And, and most most um, army officers, yeah. you know, they they had to the commanding officer had to report on whether their young officers um, had uh, had passed the the, yeah. the exam. Uh, in fact, one of his store, one of Slim's stories starts with him sitting in a tent on operations. Um, using up some of his spare time, I think he was adjunct at the time, trying to pass yet another one of these terrible Urdu exams. They had normally in peacetime, of course, this was different because he was, well, it was the end of the war. Normally in peacetime, a young officer, he had to pass out in the top 10% of Sandhurst. Uh, Montgomery, of course, who wanted to join the Indian Army was turned down, which is one yeah. of the reasons he never liked the Indian Army. But um, the, you then went to India to a British battalion for a year um, because you weren't any used to the Indian Army until you, could speak to them and you had to do your Urdu exam with the British battalion and then the language of wherever you were going so by the time you turned yeah. up in your Indian battalion you actually you, you you wouldn't have been fluent you couldn't have discussed medieval church architecture but but you were reasonably good on you could give out a set of orders and you could understand a report and that sort of thing and and it's the same I mean same when I joined I was jolly lucky and that I came top of the language course because I can pick up languages easily. It doesn't make, mean I'm intelligent, it just means I've got a knack for languages. And I speak quite a few languages. What, what did Bismarck say about people who are familiar with languages? I think he said it was a head waiter's skill. <laughs> I don't know. But I do know that apparently music and languages go together. And I'm not musical. I cannot sing a note. And I queried this with, with a, an expert in languages. He said, ah, but he said, are you any good at mathematics? And I said, well, I've got physics and 
I've got pure and applied maths at A level. He said, that's it, because mathematics and mm. ability apparently also going to go. So there we are. But but poor old Slim, going back to him, he had to, to, to sort of really learn it on the on the hoof. He became exceedingly good because later on, as a general, going around the various units, he always tried to talk to them in their own language. Yeah. And he told me a tale on the occasion when I met him after having a vision. This would have been in the 60s, I suppose. And he said he was um, he was talking. This was during the war in Burma. And he was addressing a battalion. And they simply stood there. And when he left, he said to his aide, he said, I'm, I'm rather surprised that they didn't seem to be. Do you think everything's all right? I mean, they didn't seem to be reacting at all. And his aide said, well, sir, the, the trouble is you were talking to a Maratha battalion. You were talking to them in Sikh. So you know, he, he was talking to them in a completely different language. But he did he did crack. Um, I mean, I don't suppose he was fluent in Gurumukhi or, or, or Maratha, but, but he had enough to, to be able to, to talk to them. And of course, he also had Urdu and he also had Gokali. He then became the adjutant of first six. He did a year as a company commander of A company. And of course, then and indeed now you know, in my service, uh, you have one British officer in a company. The company second command is a Gurkha commission from the ranks. And the platoon commander is a Gurkha commission from the ranks. Um, so he would have been pretty good at the language by the end of that year. He then became adjutant. And he was adjutant, I think, longer than any other. Yeah, he was a very, been. very long time as an adjutant. <laughs> yeah. and, and actually, by, by all accounts, one of the best adjutants in the, in the, in the Indian Army well, at the time. He, he was very, very good. He was very yeah. good indeed. Uh, and yet he hadn't, at this stage, he hadn't been staff trained. So, but but he, he knew how to administer. Of course, the adjutant, an adjutant now, a lot more of it is office. Then it was much more practical. It was, it was getting the commanding officer's policy across. It was getting around... There was no ops officer in a battalion in those days. So when a battalion went into the field, the adjutant is what you would now call the operations officer. So so he he learned a lot about that. I think, you know, going forward a bit, because he didn't he didn't command the sixth, he commanded a battalion of the seventh. That's right. For, for quite a short mm-hmm. period of time. That people say, oh dear, you know, why was that? But the brigade, even then, <laughs> I mean, the brigade then had um 10 battalions, uh, 20 battalions, sorry, 20 battalions. Each, each regiment had two battalions. So 20 mm-hmm. battalions, but it was still... Probably bigger than the British Army now. Uh, yeah. Yes, probably. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but there were, because there were only 12 British officers in a battalion, uh, the, the number of British officers are fairly small. So if there wasn't somebody who was the right age or had done the right courses to command a particular battalion, somebody would be brought in from another gap of battalion. And that didn't matter. I mean, that worked worked perfectly well so he uh commanded the seventh for, for a really very short period of time actually not very long at all uh and eventually became colonel of the seventh they snaffled them before we did we were a bit slow six uh, wanted them but but he said i'm terribly sorry the seventh just asked me and i've been i'm colonel of the seventh um but he yeah he he um he's unquestionably our brigade of Gurkhas greatest british officer ever I agree with Rob. I think he was unquestionably uh, the best British general of the Second World War, streets ahead of Montgomery. Now, I don't want to bore you with my views on Montgomery. Um, Go go for it, Gordon. Yeah, but is Monty's not going to come out of this well, is he? Extremely (laughs) unpleasant charlatan. Uh, (laughs) He was a poor person and a poor general. He didn't like the Indian Army, of course, because he didn't pass out. I mean, he got back time at Santos, as you know. No, I, I've got, I think, two of my death threats are for criticising Montgomery, interestingly. I, I have a... But fight. both of them? Um, you, well, I've two, two of Two out of two or two oh, out no, of... Oh, no, crikey, no, no. I've had death threats for <laughs> criticising, for supporting Haig, for being praise, praising Haig, criticising Montgomery, criticising Churchill. I, I got yeah. a, quite a lot of trolling from that. <laughs> but it's still quite a few books. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> That's the main thing. That's the main. Um, so, so, so when we get to the outbreak of war, and of course the Indian Army, well, you you can tell me. But where is Slim? He's got this sort of writing behind him now. But at the out, outbreak of war, uh, well, he, he um, the outbreak of war. He was a full colonel. He was commanding the senior officer school, and he thought that was the end of his career. You know, and he was actually I can't remember what age he was, but he was getting on. I mean, he wasn't a, he wasn't a young. He was born in eighteen ninety one, I think. Colonel, yeah. Um, so he was getting on a bit. Um, and I think he thought, well, he says himself that, that really he thought that was that was sort of it. Yes, he did say um, at one stage that he was he he thought that his future was Brighton. Yes, yes, yeah. <laughs> um, and of course he was he was lucky. I mean, but but then you make your own luck, really, don't you? He was well thought of by others. He did well in Syria and fighting up there. 
duffing up the VC French. And that sort of helped. He got a brigade command and then divisional command. He, When he became uh, a corps commander, of course, again, family, well, not family connections, but regimental connections, as a corps commander, his his two divisional commanders were, had both, were both first six Gurkhas. So they'd all, they'd served together. Yeah. Um, and as time went on, as he, as he went on in the army and got, got more and more senior, and he didn't, he, he wasn't these people, he wasn't like Montgomery. He didn't pull out his favourites. He accepted whoever was sent to him. But it so happened that a lot of his commanders, core divisional commanders, were either Gurkhas or officers who'd been at staff college with or people he knew. So they, they all knew each other. And this helped tremendously. And, and as Rob will know, when it, it was thought that um, he'd be removed, later on, the end of the war, uh, the Indian Army didn't mutiny, but the, the Indian Army made it very clear to people like my bottom that, that this wasn't acceptable. Uh, yeah, and of course, I, Slim I, I stayed on. With that. I mean, uh, the listeners to the podcast will be interested to know that, of course, 1939-1940, the Indian Army grew dramatically from, uh, uh, from about 180,000 to nearly a million by 1940. And in order to be able to sustain that dramatic growth, the Indian Army was entirely reliant on its own resources for, for command. So young officers really promoted very quickly. But it's true that Slim was very lucky because although Slim went off as a, a brigade commander to the 10th Indian Brigade to Eritrea, he only was promoted to command of the 10th Indian Division because uh, in the sort of euphemistic language of the time, the divisional commander uh, was tired. General W.A.K. Fraser actually had received a vote of no confidence by his brigade commanders and was quietly asked by Wable to retire, to resign and uh, leave the army. And Slim was then parachuted into his post. And then, of course, in March 1942, when Alexander in Burma was asking for a corps commander, there was only one name on the list who was available, and that was Slim in the 10th uh, Indian Division in Iraq at the time, or in Iran, actually, at the time. And the reality is that the army, the Indian army, grew so rapidly that there were hardly any, there's hardly anyone available to do the senior jobs. Uh, Slim was well known uh, by everybody. In fact, it's been, uh, I was able to demonstrate that it was Auchinleck who advised Slim should be appointed to the command of the Burma Corps in Burma in 1942. And uh, there, there his fortunes were made, but he was very, very lucky actually, that mm -hmm. um, uh, he was very nearly killed in Eritrea at Galabat, attacked by Italian aircraft in 1940. You know, that was his third serious wound of his of his military career. It was one thing that goes hand in hand with being a soldier, the chance of being badly hurt. Um, and, you know, without him, w the, the war would have been very different in the Far East, I'm afraid. And so you've mentioned 1942, and of course, this is smack bang in the middle of your great account, uh, War of Empires. And this is where really the Japanese are on the up fall of Singapore, February 42. Yep. Have I got that right? Yep. 15th of February 1942. Greatest British military disaster uh, yep. ever, said Churchill, I think. Yep. And he was right. It was a complete, yep. complete cock up, extraordinary proportions. Everything that could possibly go wrong went wrong. And yes, we lost Malaya, we lost Singapore, we lost Burma. But very fortunately, Slim was at the head of the Burma Corps, which comprised the majority of Alexander's Burma army. The Burma army included the Chinese. Uh, the Burma Corps got out and it marched out, carrying its weapons and saluting its commander, marched out to Imphal in May 1942. Slim saluted his army, they saluted him back. It wasn't a defeated army. And that's what most people get wrong when they think about the, the loss of Burma in 1942. It was a fighting withdrawal. It was a... A terrible loss, of course, but actually the army was intact and it was led by a, a man, Slim, who who was angry at um, the the what had happened. But he knew that the Japanese were not uh, invincible. And that's why he was angry. He was angry because he knew that these guys could be beaten. In fact, at two very significant occasions during the withdrawal from Burma in 1942, uh, Japanese divisional advances had been badly beaten by Gurkha battalions at Kokogwa and Kiosk, where large numbers of Japanese were killed uh, by Gurkha soldiers. And um, Slim just needed the opportunity to be able to train a new army to fight the Japanese on, on better terms. And we need to remember this about the Japanese in 1942. They had staffs as advantage. Britain was, and, and the empire was completely unprepared for war, certainly unprepared for fighting the Japanese. 
hadn't ever taken the Japanese seriously. By the way, when Slim in 1938 was commanding the second, seventh in uh, Gurkha rifles in Shillong, he actually went on the annual exercise uh, training his men in uh, against a Japanese enemy, 1938. This is a year after Nanking, of course. Slim was prescient enough to realize that you know when the empire went to war next, it would be against the Japanese and most other people had their heads in the sand. But it was, it was this foreknowledge and preparation and the ability to plan that enabled Slim to rebuild the, the, the Indian army to take on the Japanese in 45. I often wonder what would have happened if we'd renewed the Anglo-Japanese treaty in 1925 when, when the Americans asked us not to and we didn't. If we had done so, whether uh, the history of, of the Far East might, might have been different. Well, it would almost certainly have been very different. And it's, it was intriguing to me to discover in writing my book that the Americans had two war plans for the Pacific in the 1930s, mm. one to fight the Japanese and one to fight Britain. Yeah, fight and of course, if Britain had retained an alliance with Japan, it would have entirely uh, been in the face of American political ambitions, which, of yeah. course, were to support the Chinese. The real problem with understanding this era is much of political decision making is based either on a moral position or a power position. Mm. And of course, if we had taken a power, a, a power position, we Britain had taken a power position or position based on the necessities of power in the 1930s, we would have found ourselves in the teeth of American resistance. And yeah, it, I mean, it was Benson, I think you said that the British have always gone to war with their trade rivals eventually, and they've always won, <laughs> which right. has enabled them to push through the, the naval sort of... Yes thing in, in through congress yeah. yeah no i think yes probably they that we probably have ended up like that i don't know whether we could have moderated japanese ambitions well i i think we we would have done and and i think the reality is that you know, let's just assume that we're going for a tangent but it is an interesting one uh it's if we just assume and i do this with my students sometimes if we assume that britain and japan were nominal allies it would have meant that when Japan went to war against America in 1941, remember, this war was regarded by the war party in Japan to be a preventative war, not a an actual or yeah. anticipating it to be an attritional war. It was a preventative war to stop the Americans getting involved in Japanese operations in Southeast Asia. I think that Britain's positions would have been left alone. Oh, yeah. yeah but I, I just wonder whether we could have persuaded them not, not to do that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, we, wouldn't we, we have just appeased like we did in? Well, we were appeasing. We appeased them all the way through 1939, 1940. We closed the Burma Road in 1940 yeah, we did. Uh, because the Japanese had asked us to stop supplying Chiang Kai-shek's forces. Uh, so yes, it's one of those what ifs. If the result of that appeasement may well have been that we would have been attacked anyway. Yeah, you know? it could well have been. It could well have been. When I was writing my book in the Second World War, I tried to find Japanese who served in the war, and I couldn't find any. But I did talk to a number of Japanese academics. And the question I, and these were young academics, the question I said was, look, in the Russia-Japanese war, you behaved properly. Uh, in the First World War, you behaved properly. What happened between the First World War and the Second World War in, in 1941 for you to behave so appallingly? What do you mean, appallingly? I said, well, take the hospital in Hong Kong, for example, and Singapore. You, you killed patients in their bed. You raped nurses. What was that? Oh, no, they said, no, 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 this is Western propaganda. This is, this didn't happen. And one of them said, well, there may have been individuals who misbehaved, but it wasn't institutionalized. And I said, look, we've got archive <laughs> film of what you did in Nanking. Yes. <laughs> but they weren't, they see themselves as victims. Yeah. You know, we dropped an atom bomb on them. <laughs> I mean, I think, I don't think they still accept. I mean, the Germans at least put their hands up. But the Japanese have never really said, you know. Well, the, the yeah. Japanese, I, I think there's certainly a variety of opinion in Japan now. There's there are there's quite a very strong sense in Japan that what now that what the mm -hmm. Japanese did in the war was wrong and outrageous and mm -hmm. uh, and and so on. But it was very interesting when I first went to Japan to interview Japanese veterans in 2000. I came up with a very strong impression that polite and interesting though these men were, they were still advocates of war. And they no. didn't want to say sorry. In fact, that's the one thing that Japan has never done is apologized for the war or for its its behavior. Uh, and it's, it's interesting in this in this regard to recognize just how many people died as a result of Japanese imperialism. Many, many more Asian races died as a result of Japanese aggrandizement in the war yeah, than yeah. did Britons or Americans.
Uh, it's also important to remember that many more Japanese died as a result of Japanese imperialism. Oof, really? Large number. The Japanese were very good at killing people. They were particularly good at killing their own side. And this was a very, very significant <laughs> failure. Of Japanese Governments people. were changed by assassination, not by votes. So, so just shifting the conversation along to, so we've talked about, you've mentioned a couple of generals already, I think, or commanders, I should probably mm. call them because they ended up as field marshals harold mm. alexander and mm. and montgomery and then there's allenbrook as well and of the i mean i would have thought harold alexander was was numero uno because he was in the irish guards so that that immediately <laughs> makes him part of the elite but you have no doubt that slim is 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 the best of the british how about the allied commanders so i'm going to say the word Patton, which will make gordon laugh i think and me and me. Okay. And Bradley? Well, I, I think... I, I would think read it's... Bradley. I would read yes. Bradley. Yes. I, I think, and I, and think... I would also, contrary to most public opinion, I rate MacArthur. I rate MacArthur as well. I, I, my, my view about all of this is it's a little bit invidious asking anyone to, to rate them from um, numero uno down, because life's not like that. You, you need a... a, a a bag of golf clubs you need every club and every club is slightly different uh, you the way you assess generals is what they achieved and what they achieved it with and i would absolutely agree with people who have done the analysis the detailed analysis of generalship in the second world war lloyd clark's done it recently andrew roberts has done it and a few other peter Caddick adams has done it in north africa as well and i think you just need to say okay what, what do these people achieve? Cutting it to the quick, Slim was able to rebuild an army, an army that actually comprised about 1.3 million men, most of whom, 87%, were Indian, to defeat the Japanese in battle, not just once, but twice. Japanese armies were defeated in, in the field on at least three occasions in the Second World War. The first at Kahima by Slim, 1944. The second at Mandalay Mactila, again by Slim and his Indian, largely Indian, African, British army in 1945, and third, thirdly, by Zukov and Manchuria in 1945. And that's not to diminish one bit the island hopping campaign of the US Marine Corps, Navy and Army, but they were different fights and they needed different sorts of generalship. The generalship that Slim evidenced in 1942, 43, 44 and 45 was really quite remarkable because it was political. I, it was grand strategic. He understood the grand strategic dimension to the war. He understood the importance of the Chinese. He got on very well with the Americans. He got on very well with the Japanese. Uh, so, sorry, with the Chinese. That was a bit of a slip, wasn't it? Yes, um, I don't think he did get on with the Japanese. He did. He did. <laughs> But in circumstances that they would have they would have rejected. It's really important to understand what he achieved with the people, but also with the logistics. So I keep on reminding people, just just for your listeners, the entire line of communication in the Far East that is from that supported the army in the field. And we're now looking at 1945 from Calcutta through to Rangoon is a distance of 2,400 miles. Well, the distance from London to Moscow is 1,800 miles. So this is 600 miles further on. It's akin to fighting a war in Moscow or beyond Moscow from London. And it was unbelievable. When Slim decided in June 1944 that he was going to follow up Mutaguchi's 15th Army and, and, and go back and follow them into Burma, across the Chinwin and then the Irrawaddy, his um, logistician said to him, but this, you, you've got the chin when you've got across. You, you don't have any boats. And Slim said, we're going to build them. How are you going to build them? Well, the 14th Army built 550 10-ton barges, each barge able to carry a Sherman or a Lee Grant tank. Um, and they built two little gunboats for the chin and the Irrawaddy as well. 550 10-ton barges by cutting down teak forests. They, everything they did, they did themselves. This was just, it's quite extraordinary what this army did. The 4th Indian Corps, charging from Mactila down to Tungu uh, and to Rangoon, the same distance from Paris to Marseille, in an extraordinary campaign in 1944, March, April, early May 1944, had 90% of their combat supplies, so that's rations, fuel and ammunition, uh, delivered on the ground by C-47s. It all came by air. So you've got a Sherman tank brigade as part of the, the vanguard of this corps, with all its fuel coming in by air. No one else was doing that. These aircraft were landing under Japanese fire in airfields hurriedly bulldozed out of the jungle by combat engineers with uh, little bulldozers that had also been landed by C-47 under Japanese fire. The whole story of 1945 is mind-boggling. 
Mm. So most of the other campaigns in Europe and indeed across the Pacific were based on the precautionary principle, quite rightly. Let's let's um, do the mostest with the leastest in order to be able to um, achieve uh, a victory where we weren't doing it on the, the blood and the sacrifice of your men. Um, Slim was able to do it in a slightly different way, but a very profound way, in a way that's, uh, in my view, pretty unique. I can't look through back back through military history and find anything of the same size. Now, so that's that's my point. You need to be able to assess generalship on the basis of what these individuals did, and you can't really compare what Slim did in '45 with the methodical yet professional and pretty well uh, developed advance by the 21st Army Group in Europe in 1944-45. Monty was not a political general. He made all sorts of terrible mistakes. He uh, didn't get on with Eisenhower. In fact, he, his behavior towards Eisenhower after the war was outrageous. Uh, even when Eisenhower, Eisenhower was, was president, Monty you know, went on a tour of the press conference. Yes, I'm falling. <laughs> slagging off Eisenhower as a general. I mean, it was just the most bizarre. It, he wasn't a gentleman. No. Uh, and, and yet no one doubts that actually he did a pretty good job in corralling the 8th Army in October 1942 to win the the second battle of El Alamein. The first I battle. are good. Well, it's very interesting I that I, I very recently read the, some amazing memoirs of, of a young man in the 9th Battalion of the Northumberland Fusiliers who was at El Alamein, who was astonished that Monty should even consider doing a frontal assault through the German defences when the left flank was open and we had massive air superiority. So I do, I do agree with you on that, Gordon. So I guess you've you've clearly laid out why Slim was the most was the best British commander of the war. And I know this is all, all pointless conversations and, and and it's it's just a bit of fun. But I guess that takes him into the final with uh, up against the Duke of Wellington and the Duke of Marlborough. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, I, I think Marlborough and Wellington and Slim are the three best, and Cromwell, are the four best British commanders, battlefield commanders in, in, in history or in over the last thousand years. And we, we mustn't forget Cromwell in this because actually from the Battle of Winsby, which is what, when was that, 1643, when he deployed his cavalry for the first time, he showed an understanding of the need for battlefield victory and, and the way to achieve it, which separated him from the ordinary commander who knew how to deliver a traditional attack. And I think that's the point about Wellington. Wellington was intelligent enough to be able to deploy his troops to make best strategic effect. And he wasn't constrained by the book. Marlborough, exactly the same. In fact, uh, we know that our friend Saul David, when he's, he's evaluated Marlborough, Wellington and Slim, he always puts Marlborough first. And I do think the Danube campaign was really quite extraordinary. This man, Marlborough, really understood the political military dimension brilliantly well. He was also able to motiv motivate uh, his soldiers to an extraordinary degree. And I, ultimately, I always go back to that as well. You need to be a political general, by which I mean you need to understand the political dimension to your to your campaigning, but you need to know how to bring your soldiers along with you. Wellington did that brilliantly, old Boney, and Slim did it magnificently as well. You would never, I've often said this, you would never... Uh, call Montgomery Uncle Bernard, but it was a natural thing for his boys and his Gurkhas and the Indian Army to call Slim Uncle Bill. Mm. Um, and I think a, a similar epithet recorded. Well, we know we know Boney from Wellington, um, and something similar would have been uh, given. Is it, isn't Boney Bonaparte? I thought nosy. Well, it's nosy. 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 Yes. Nosy. Yep. You've got yeah. me on that one. You're definitely <laughs> right, nosy. Uh, but I, you know, the, the reality is the soldiers knew him. They trusted him. They knew him that he would. They knew that he'd get him out of a scrape. It was intelligent command. You know, people often give me this question. I mean, James Holland has done this a few times. What about Alexander in Italy? And I would say ordinary generalship of a methodical kind. Oh, yeah, that think, sounds like damning with faint praise. I, I think Rob's absolutely right. You, you you can really only judge them by by what they did in the, in the circumstances, the situation that they did it in. And I think Alexander was unfortunate in that Italy was an unfashionable campaign. Uh, you know, nobody was terribly interested in Italy, really. The, Normandy was what everybody was looking at. Uh, Italy was bottom of the millboard for supplies and reinforcements and all the rest of it. And I, d I don't think anyone could have done it any better. I mean, it was a flog up, up the peninsula. I think Alexander's great strength, I think, was that people liked him. You know, he got 
you could say the same about Azza, actually, but, but I mean, Alexander, you know, he commanded a battalion at 23, he commanded a brigade at 25, he commanded the Polish Legion in Russia, in the Russian Civil War, because he spoke Russian. And, and perhaps if he'd given, you know, a different scenario or a different situation, he would have been every bit as good as, as uh, the people were talking about. You know, he was unfortunate in that he got sent off to Burma at a time when nobody could have pulled the chestnuts out of the fire in Burma. Italy unfashionable and all the rest of it but i agree with rob on his uh, i agree slim wellington marlborough you're not keen I, on you know, marlborough are you Gordon? I, well my problem about marlborough i would add in henry v actually to that oh, my yes. problem with marlborough is that he'd been advanced now i agree that nice guys don't necessarily win wars and marlborough did win his wars and he was a really understood logistics which is vital but he He'd been advanced, all his sinecures and his colonel station, all this promotion, all came from the Duke of York. Later, of course, James II. And then, of course, when he saw which way the wind was blowing, he 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 jumped onto the bandwagon he thought was going to win. He said he did it for the protection of the Protestant religion. Bollocks, he did it because he realised that, that uh, he, was, he wanted to be on the winning side. Now, when James was in exile, he kept in contact with James, just in case the thing turned again. When he effectively retired, uh, he really became very grumpy and very bolshy, whereas Wellington never did. I mean, Wellington, or everything Wellington did right to the day he died was done in, uh, for the public good, as he, as he kept saying. So those are my objections to, to Marlborough, but that doesn't mean he, that doesn't affect his, his generalship. I mean, he was, as, as Rob rightly says, his Danube campaign and the logistic effort to get that mm. army in being there and to fight that campaign and win it. Um, and, and and to have the sense to recognise that he needed the local people, this long expeditionary yeah. force yeah. on side, yeah. and to discipline his army to understand that that is a real. Problem. This is another quality to be a great British commander. I mean, not only do you have to stand, understand logistics because we fight our wars in the in the fourth world very often, but you have to be able to get on with allies because we're usually a minority. We fight our wars with allies. Montgomery couldn't get on with allies. All sorts of problems, as, as you rightly alluded to, where Slim did understand that he might not have liked the Chinese, but he jolly well had to get on with them. He may not have, all, although actually he did say that, he said Wingate was fine once once you got to him. It was his staff, that, that his staff apparently were frightened of Wingate and they wouldn't let anyone get near him. But Slim said that actually Wingate, once you got to him, was, was perfectly all right and perfectly helpful. But Slim understood the need to, to keep people on side, keep Wellington the same. I mean, Wellington thoughts about the Spanish are unprintable, but he knew he had to keep them on side and he ensured that he did. Marlborough had awful problems with the Dutch government, but he knew he had to keep them on side and he did. Uh, Henry V knew that Again, a minority, a small fighting, and he had to keep the Burgundians on side, and, and he did. The reason I add Henry V was that Henry V developed the English army into a professional army that yeah. we would recognize today yeah. with a proper rank structure, military law, and all the rest of it. So I would add him. But otherwise, yeah, I quite agree. Those, those are quite the, ruthless the, training as well. That, that yeah. went beyond, that, that went all the way back into the civilian encampments. Yes, quite yeah. extraordinary. Uh, the logistical tale as well. Mm. well. Well, I think it's fair to say that none of them have met the literary standards that Bill Slim has. So <laughs> I think we'll we'll have to end it there. Uh, the, 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 I've put links to the four books in the show notes for listeners. Um, but Rob, you've edited these. Um, it was great of you to put, to put them together. And I, I guess just leave the last word to you talking about these. Uh, well, they deserve to be on everyone's shelves. If you really want to understand the true nature of uh, leadership uh, and generalship in the war, then you need to understand the person behind it. And uh, these books are really, really fabulous uh, examination of Slim as a, as a person. And um, you can get a sense of the, the times he was living in in the 1930s, the times before the war clouds drew close and, and over us and engulfed everyone. You know, they, they are, they've been rescued from from obscurity and anyone who's interested in slim or in generalship needs to, to read them and enjoy them and i'm sure you will great stuff thanks both thanks gordon thanks robert not at all thank you very much for listening please do share with friends and subscribe and rate and review if you can plenty more great history coming up until then thank you and good night mm-hmm.